Good evening. Welcome to Round Hill United Methodist Church for this Ash Wednesday service. And it's so good to, to be live with you finally once again after so many services we've had to do pre-recorded. It's so good to see some of you in the comments and being able to, to speak with uh, one another in this way uh, live once again. If you're joining us for the first time and are unfamiliar with this format on Facebook Live, uh, there are ways for you to talk with one another during this time as we are, are worshiping together. Uh, there's a comment section and that allows you to comment, uh, to speak to one another uh, as the, the service goes along. Uh, you can lift up any prayers or anything that you might wanna say uh, during this time together. There's also a thumbs up and a heart, which is a, a like and a love button that allow you to express your praise, your, your love, your joy, your amens or hallelujahs during this time of worship. And we're, we're glad that you can join us for Ash Wednesday. If Ash Wednesday is something that is new to you, uh, Ash Wednesday is a service that kicks off a season in the time of the church known as Lent. Lent is the journey that begins our march to the cross, our march towards Easter. And Lent is a, a time of introspection, a time of reflection of how we grow closer to God, how God has transformed our lives and how we can accept that grace. And Ash Wednesday begins this time by reflecting upon our own sin and our own mortality. We come together as a people to reflect upon why we need God in the first place. And so I'm glad that you are here with us as we can gather together in praise of a one who has come to save us. As we gather together this evening, I invite us to join together in a time of prayer. This is a prayer that you will see on your screen, and so I invite us to read these words as a prayer offered up together. Let us pray. O oh God, maker of everything and judge of all that you have made, from the dust of the earth you have formed us, and from the dust of death you would raise us up. By the redemptive powers of the cross, create in us clean hearts and put within us a new spirit, that we may repent of our sins and lead lives worthy of your calling, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As we continue in this time of worship and praise, let us do so by lifting up those hearts that we are asking God to clean, and lifting up our voices uh, by singing our first praise song. Uh, you can either sing along with the words that are on your screen, or you can use it as a time of reflection as you listen to our praise band as they sing our opening praise song. Our scripture for this evening is Psalm 51, verses 1 through 17. Have mercy on me, O God, 
according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you alone, have I sinned, and done what is evil in your sight, that you are justified in your sentence, and blameless when you pass judgment. Indeed, I was born guilty, a sinner when my mother conceived me. You desire truth in the inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all of my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain in me a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from bloodshed, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your deliverance. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you have no delight in sacrifice. If I were to give a burnt offering, you would not be pleased. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. The word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you join me in a word of prayer this evening? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Remember you are dust, and to dust you shall return. These are the words that we traditionally hear on this Ash Wednesday. And if I'm being honest, Ash Wednesday has always been a very difficult service for me. It's hard to put that sign of our mortality on the forehead of little children as they have their whole life ahead of them. It feels almost spiteful to put those ashes on the forehead of the elderly or those battling with diseases like cancer or Alzheimer's. Sadly, I have had moments of placing those ashes on the foreheads of those for whom the words were all too real, who I didn't get to see that next Ash Wednesday. All of these things, they, they stick with you. And this year in particular is a, a hard Ash Wednesday for us all. And why do we need to hear these words this year, that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. In the time that we are facing a global pandemic, why do we need to hear them as if we don't already know that they are true? Since we last met for Ash Wednesday, 450,000 Americans alone have died from this pandemic since we last met last year. Most of us know a loved one, a family member, a friend, a neighbor, co-worker, someone that we have lost. Or we have lost a job. We've lost a business. We've gone through this past year wearing our masks because we know that we don't want to, one, spread this deadly virus, nor do we want to catch it ourselves. For most of the past year, and including tonight, we are not gathering in person because 
we are so keenly aware of the very fact that we are vulnerable. In the pandemic, we have seen it shows no bias. The, the pandemic, it can affect all of us, regardless of age, regardless of race, regardless of gender, regardless of political ideology, regardless of nationality, regardless even if we have led what we consider uh, a good and faithful life. We've seen that the pandemic can affect each and every one of us. What it's reminded us is of something that we proclaim each year as Christians as we put these ashes on our foreheads. That no matter of young or old, healthy or infirmed, you are dust and to dust you shall return. No matter who we are, we all will die. Now, why do we spend a whole service talking about this, I mean, let's face it, downer of an issue, this downer of a topic? I mean, shouldn't, as Christians, we be talking about things that are more hopeful, more energetic, things like Christ's resurrection, things like our glory that we get to receive in heaven. Certainly. We certainly should be talking about those things. Those things are the central tenets of our faith. But what happens is many times we fail to truly grasp or understand salvation when we haven't wrestled with sin. We struggle to understand the enormity and the beauty of eternal life and the life abundant that Christ gives when we fail to recognize the reality and starkness of death. We talk about these things because in recognizing them and being aware of them, we are able to actually live in the fullness of what God has for us. Yeah, we could skirt around these issues. We could skirt around talking about sin and death because it makes us uncomfortable or it makes us sad. But so often what we're really doing if we're skirting around it is what we are, we're skirting around talking about salvation itself. And as we look at the Bible, it does not skirt around talking about death or sin. So much so that as many of us read it, it actually probably makes us feel uncomfortable. As modern readers, it makes us uncomfortable with how much it is talked about. It seems to offend our sensibilities. It can seem as though they are actually obsessed with talking about sin and with death. And many of us in certain traditions that we may have grown up with, that, that's how we feel ourselves, that we have grown up in a, a world obsessed with sin and death. And I get that. But maybe part of it is also that there's a little bit of truth to we also avoid sin and death. We avoid talking about these things. I mean, after all, it was only in 1967 when the, the modern hospice movement really took shape. A movement that helped us to fight this urge to hide from death, to fight against it at all costs, and to instead Embrace a, a full life of living even when death is on the doorsteps. To do what ethicists call dying well. To practice living fully even in the end of our life. Many years ago, I was an intern at a, at a, as a chaplain at a hospital. And the teacher there, she taught us that so many people are afraid of even talking about death that we often don't even use the word itself. Even when someone close to us has, has died, we, we tend to, and I almost just did it myself, we tend to use a different word, like passed away, gone to another place, better place. We hardly ever use the word 
itself, death. Because of this, because of our avoidance of this, when we look at the Bible, it can seem like it is all obsessed with sin and death. That's all they talk about. But their obsession is really not as much about sin and death as it is about life and life in the fullness, the fullness of God, what living a true life with God looks like. Each year there is a set of, of scriptures that we read for Ash Wednesday. And it is our rotation that you, you basically read the same three or four scriptures every year. And all of these scriptures for Ash Wednesday point to this, this understanding. There's moments in each of them where the people or the person writing has experienced something and they see themselves facing a, a or going with a law or with a tradition or something of their own religion that they're, they're trying to uphold, they're trying to do, and yet it is not showing fruit. It's not growing them closer to God. It's not helping them to live out a life with God. And so the scriptures then talk to us more about what that life with God really looks like, what a turned heart towards God is all about. And when all these scriptures talk about the sin and death, what it is, is really talking about is recognizing what it takes to move towards this life. Recognizing what it is that God is offering us. If you look at one of these texts like Joel, Joel is happening in the midst not of a pandemic, but is happening in the midst of a deadly swarm of, of locusts. Locusts that are attacking all the all the plants and vegetation and, and causing people to starve. And in the midst of this, Joel calls the people together for prayer and for fasting and says, rend your heart, not your clothes. Now, he says this because in that time, tearing your clothes was a, a formal way or a traditional way of showing your mourning, showing your repentance. This was kind of the public decoration that you were repenting or mourning of what was happening. But Joel was telling them, this tearing of our clothes, if it is not actually changing our hearts and helping us to turn towards God, it is doing nothing for us. So turn your hearts instead to God. We see the same in our gospel scripture with Jesus as he's telling people to not pray or practice their piety in front of others, but instead to needs to be focused on a life that is desiring God, that in fact, where our treasures are, there our heart will be also. And then there's David in our Psalm 51 that we read this evening. David is dejected, as we can read. David is feeling guilt and weight for all of the sins that he has committed, fear of death, and so he prays that God will give him a clean heart. And as he does this, he realizes that God doesn't want from him the traditional atonement, the traditional way of being forgiven of these sins, of a burnt offering. But instead, God wants from him a broken spirit and a contrite heart. Broken spirit and a contrite heart, as he says. Now, what does all that mean? Why does God want a broken spirit and contrite heart from us? Why is there all this talk about our heart in all these Ash Wednesday scriptures in the first place? Well, if you can, think about your life before the pandemic started. I know it was actually a long time ago and it, it's hard to do, but if you can, think about what you were doing, what you were focused on, what your priorities were, what you were concerned about. If you were like most Americans, you were probably running around like a chicken with their head cut off. Apologies to our church chickens for that metaphor, but if you're like most Americans, this is what you're doing, running from one meeting to another, one appointment to another, to practice, then to, to home until you had almost no time for yourself. We were worried and preoccupied with so many different things. So many things were in our minds and on our shoulders, and then the pandemic hit. 
everything seemed different. Everything changed. I remember for me, the first moment that I realized that something was so different and off in this pandemic was, you know, strangely enough, when they canceled the NCAA tournament. And it just felt like that doesn't happen. You know, this is supposed to be something that happens every year. This is part of the rhythm. And for that to have gone away seemed like such a huge loss at the time. But then as we continued to be disrupted more and more, as we saw more and more actual loss, what we started to find is an understanding of what really mattered and what really matters in our life. But many of us have started to realize how much we simply miss a hug from our friends and from our families. How much we, we miss just coming together for worship as imperfect as it may be, but coming together in person and worshiping God together. And yes, we've began to think about life and in death how fragile and vulnerable we really are. But not just our vulnerability or our fragility, but many of us have also taken that as a moment to think about what does life itself look like? What does good life look like? What does life in its fullness look like? This is the broken spirit and the contrite heart that David is talking about. One that strips away this delusion of grandeur that many of us have, that we can do it all, that it's all on us, that we've got it under control. One that takes away our idea of immortality, that we are untouchable, that our time will come, but sometime down the road, it makes us realize nothing is guaranteed. One that helps us to understand the, the sacredness of the life that we have, and wants us to offer that to God. This is the heart that David talks about. It's like the, the praise song Heart of Worship talks about. You know, when the music fades and all is stripped away and I simply come. It's that idea of stripping away all that really doesn't matter and coming to the heart of worship, coming to the heart of what matters for our lives. On Ash Wednesday, that's what we do. We strip away those things by looking at the things that get to the heart of the matter, our own sin and our own mortality. They force us to recognize the sacredness of our life, and they force us to recognize the here and now. It puts a little urgency in us. As we put ashes on our head this evening, we do so as a journey, a journey towards the cross, a journey towards Christ's resurrection. And we start with this Ash Wednesday tonight because we are able to fully appreciate that journey, fully appreciate what God has done for us when we first start with why we need it. As we put these ashes on later, if they are simply just another thing we do, if they're just a routine, a ritual, if they're just a emotion that we're going through, they will mean nothing to us. There's nothing special about the ashes itself that transform us. What God desires from us is for us to rend our hearts, not our clothes or not our ashes. What God desires from us is a clean heart, a broken spirit. One that allows us, as the gospel say, to, to truly examine where our treasures lie. Because what we find is that good news gospel of Jesus saves, that's not lost in this season of Lent. The good news that Jesus saves doesn't go anywhere. That is here. 
But this season of Lent allows us to examine what that actually means for us. When we say that Jesus saves, what does that actually mean in our lives? And tonight we begin to understand by hearing those words. Remember you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Amen. As I mentioned, Lent is a season. It's a preparation for us. It's a time in which we prepare ourselves to experience, to get ourselves ready for what the good news of Christ's death and resurrection means for us. Now, traditionally, Lent we know as something of a time of giving up something. And as we're in this time of pandemic, it can seem hard for us to think about giving up something more as we have already given up so much. Or in fact, so much has already been taken from us. But as we've talked about, the idea is not for us to simply make a performative action, but it's for us to do things that actually bring us closer to God. Hopefully the actions that we can take during this season of Lent are things that actually give us energy, that bring us closer to God, that that help us to be filled in a time where we can be so drained. And so I invite you to take on a Lenten discipline of some sort, and there are many that we can choose from. You can choose to to pick up reading the Bible, or doing it more, or picking a certain book of the Bible, or a certain uh, reading plan, or to join one of the study groups that we have. We have two women's groups, we have a, uh, and then we'll have another uh, group that is beginning next Wednesday, looking at Adam Hamilton's Unafraid. There's also youth and children's opportunities as well for Sunday school. So opportunities for everybody in that aspect. Maybe a devotional reading in the morning is what you need. Or looking at different ways of addressing prayer life. Almsgiving is one of the traditional things that we do during Lent, which is just a, a fancy way of saying giving. Giving to those who need So maybe find ways to give to those who need. Or service, serving those in need. Journaling can be a wonderful way of of prayer or or going, getting closer to God. Or the traditional one that we think of is fasting. But fasting can take many different routes. Fasting can be from food, as you think of. But it could be food in different ways. It could be a, a fast from meat. It could be a fast from alcohol. It can also be a, a fast from something else other than food. A social media fast. It can be a fast from something that is pulling you away from a holier life with God. All of these things are not things to be a burden or to add to you, but are things that help you to examine and grow closer to God. So I invite you to take on one of these Lenten challenges this season. And as you think about what it is that you might be taking on for your Lenten challenge, for your Lenten discipline this year, I invite you to do so as you simply hear uh, a wonderful gift that we have gotten uh, and are able to share Uh, Harmony UMC has shared some of their music with us that we are able to to be able to be blessed by a friend of uh, the pastor there. Um, Angela T has uh, sung uh, the, the famous song, The Prayer. And so I invite you to hear this beautiful singing of the prayer and just think about how you might be able to grow closer to God during this time of Lent. Let us go to the Lord in this this prayer. where we go and help us to be wise in times when we don't know let it 
Thank you again to Harmony UMC for sharing that beautiful gift with us. At this time, it is an opportunity for that imposition of the ashes that we have talked about all evening. And hopefully you've received one of these packs uh, from those delivering around, or maybe you've been able to pick one up. Uh, if you're not, feel free. You can uh, use even the dirt outside as a remembrance um, that we are dust and to dust you shall return. I invite that if you have others with you, that you, that you let them be the ones that uh, put the cross on your forehead. Uh, and if not, feel free to put it on your own. And I'm going to just go ahead and uh, say the, the words for you now. Uh, but again, if someone is with you, have them say it to you as well. But I invite you in this time to remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. As you are doing that, uh, doing the imposition of the ashes for yourself or for others, 
I invite you to, to hear about some of the things, again, that are upcoming. Uh, we have the uh, Adam Hamilton study that is beginning uh, next Wednesday night via Zoom. Uh, it's called Unafraid at 7 o'clock. Uh, and so you can uh, join us uh, and find that information uh, in the e-note. We know that some people are having uh, troubles with the e-note, and we're trying to work on that. Uh, one solution that we have tried to find and we're uh, offering up is uh, to try to put office at roundhillumc.org in your recipients list, and maybe that will allow it to come through. But we are working on that issue, and so uh, we're, we'll hopefully be able to get that uh, working to those who are not receiving it. Also, um, just a reminder, it was hopefully in your packet, uh, but as you remove these ashes, uh, there are sometimes a, uh, it can be a chemical reaction for some people's skin uh, if you use water. So what would be best to re uh, remove it, uh, other than maybe a dry cloth, if that doesn't work, you can use olive oil to remove as well. This time I invite you to go forth in this journey to the cross, preparing yourself, having now recognized the realities of our sin and death, having contemplated it, wrestled with it, and allowed it to shape you, and creating a clean heart in yourself, not by your own doing, but by opening yourself to be transformed by God. Let this be a journey that we all go on together. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.